At this time, if you could turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, we're going to be looking at verses 8 to 11. Again, we've been going through a sermon series on spiritual disciplines, and you might be thinking to yourself, uh, why is rest one of the topics of spiritual disciplines? Uh, we've gone over topics such as you know, reading the Bible and praying, and those are some things that we tend to think about when we think about spiritual disciplines, kind of us working and doing something uh, to uh, help our spiritual growth. And usually rest doesn't fall into that category. But I would actually argue that uh, rest is a spiritual discipline. And it's something that, especially in our day and age, we actually have to work towards in order to fulfill. Um, as you know, you know very well, it's getting harder and harder for us to... Um, fully and and deeply rest and so uh, i wanted to intentionally include this as one of the topics of our spiritual disciplines and so again that's exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11 if you can stand please at this time out of reverence for god's word uh, please god please give god your full and undivided attention to the reading of God's holy word, starting with verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of God. You may be seated. And let's once again bow our heads and ask God to give us help, insight, and understanding into his word. Father, we come uh, before you, uh, tired, uh, weary, restless, and Father, we do pray that, Lord, you would teach us, Lord, to rest ourselves in you. Uh, Father, we thank you for this gift of a commandment. Father, we pray that we would not see this as um, a restriction, but, Lord, help us to see this as a replenishment of our bodies and ultimately our souls. Father, I pray for all of my brothers and sisters Uh, sitting here today. Um, You know us, Lord. You know our concerns. You know our worries. You know our our thoughts. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And we pray that you would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever we meet someone, uh, we are always asked the question, how are you? Uh, I'm sure that uh, even right after our service today, uh, immediately when we uh, break up into fellowship, we'll immediately ask the question, how are you to one another? It's the most common form of greeting. How are you? How are you doing? And we usually answer the question with the common responses such as, uh, fine, thank you, or uh, I'm good, I'm pretty good. And Again, we, we answer it in that way because we take this question as a very light hello or another form of, uh, hey, um, how are you? But let's say that you're not in a group of small group of people, but rather you're with a close friend, maybe one-on-one, and they ask you the question, how are you? Uh, I think uh, when we ask we are asked that uh, deeper question on a deeper level, I think most of us would honestly answer that question, I'm good, but I'm busy. I'm good, but uh, I'm exhausted. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you, if asked the question, um, are you tired this morning, uh, would say in your minds, yes, are you exhausted this morning? Uh, I think, like a lot of you, um, I too would have my hand raised straight into the air. I think busyness and exhaustion, it has become the standard reality of the majority of human beings. 
over the last couple decades, life has become progressively busier and busier. Uh, when I was in high school, I think only a small minority of uh, students took AP classes. Uh, and usually it was during your junior year or your senior year. Now it's almost like everyone takes AP classes. In my last youth group, the students were taking AP classes starting from ninth grade. And on top of all that, uh, they have tutoring, they have extracurricular activities uh, with sports, not only sports after school, but even sports on the weekends, even sports on Sundays. They have drama and dance and music. And you know, a lot of these students, they after doing all this, they get home maybe 9, 10 o'clock, and they don't sleep until 1 or 2 in the morning. And so we see that they're not only dedicated, but they're devoted to their future ambitions. As Pastor Kevin DeYoung says, we're crazy busy uh, this day and age. And it's probably no different uh, even after high school for those of you who are in college or grad school or, or working. And it's not just for students, it's for people of all ages, even for young children, uh, even for older adults uh, who are unable to retire from working. The pace of life nowadays has become busier and faster than ever before. We feel like there are never enough hours in a day. We often expend everything that we have in the tank. People feel overworked, overwhelmed, and overstressed. Uh, there was a year where I was working as a, a PE teacher at a Christian school, and uh, my schedule uh, during this year was that I would wake up maybe around 6 o'clock or even before 6 o'clock. I would quickly get ready, maybe make a lunch if I had enough time, drive an hour through traffic to work, drive an hour back. And that was on a good day uh, when I had a normal schedule. On top of that, when it was coaching season, whether it was for cross country or I also coached uh, girls basketball, uh, I would sometimes get home eight, nine, nine o'clock, and depending on where the, the meet or the games were, and on top of that, I had youth group on Friday nights and on Sundays. So again, I'm sure in your respective field as well, in your particular life stage, you are just as busy um, as I am or as I was. We are all very busy. It doesn't seem to stop as well. It feels like we always have to try to get ahead or at the very least just try to keep up because everyone seems to be going at 90 miles an hour. You know, the terms uh, burnout or being stretched too thin, it was something that affected only a small minority before, but now it seems to affect us all. Society as a whole, it unfortunately doesn't help us in this cause. Modern culture, it actually promotes this hustle and grind lifestyle. Busyness, it's actually a badge of honor. Um, sometimes you're even shamed or looked down upon if you're not busy doing something. And so people are studying harder, working longer, and taking less vacation than ever before. But the irony is that many people, they feel busy and occupied, but at the same time, they're not always productive or feel accomplished. And on top of all that, in this technological postmodern society that we live in, we, s we feel like we have to post and let everyone know how busy we are as well. With things like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, we literally know what everyone is doing all the time. You know, this pers person is pursuing this thing and that person is in that place. So we're not just connected, we're hyper-connected now. And this feeds into our mentality that we always have to be doing something. So we don't just have information overload, we even have opinion overload, people commenting on everything and everything. The news, politics, 
controversies. They are always in our faces in real time. Now these people said these things and those people are involved with that. There's just so much noise that is constantly um, speaking around us. All that to say, we are very busy people and we are very restless people. Sometimes we literally need to learn to shut down and reset and restart ourselves. Knowing this, our God and Father in heaven, he lovingly commands us to get some rest. Uh, If you look at the fourth commandment on Sabbath rest, it's actually God's longest commandment of the Ten Commandments. And maybe it's so long because God knows that it is probably the most ignored and the most neglected of the Ten Commandments. And so uh, we are going to be looking at this fourth and longest commandment of the Ten Commandments. And as we look at um, this commandment, you know, we really want to take a deep breath, not only physically, but spiritually, and not only learn about this commandment, but really seek to live it out. And so we're going to go over three main questions concerning the Sabbath. First, what is the Sabbath? Secondly, why should we Sabbath? And then finally, uh, how can we better observe the Sabbath? So first question. Sorry, if you could turn the slide for me. Uh, First main point, what is the Sabbath? What is the Sabbath? Most basically, the Sabbath is a day that is different from the other days of the week. The Sabbath is a day that is different from the other days of the week. If you look at uh, verse 11, it says that the Lord made the Sabbath day holy. And verse 8, it also tells us to keep the day holy. The word holy simply means set apart, unlike, or different. That's what the word holy means. So God created and commanded one day of the week to be set apart, to be different, to be unlike the other days of the week. The Sabbath is meant to feel different, look different, and be different from every other day of the week. And in chapter uh, 31 of Exodus, verse 14, it says, You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. So not only is the Sabbath set apart For God's sake, it is set apart for your sake. Also in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Sabbath not only blesses God, but the Sabbath also uh, benefits you. It is for God's glory, but it is also for your good. Now, how is the Sabbath day different? How is it different from the other days of the week? There are two main ways that it is different from other days of the week. It is different in that it is a day that is dominated by rest and worship. It's dominated by rest and worship. What did God do on the Sabbath? In verse 11, it says that he rested. And in verse 12, it says that he worshiped by blessing the day and enjoying himself enjoying his creation glorifying himself so the sabbath is a day of imitation for us like father like sons and daughters you on the sabbath are patterning uh, the rhythm of your life to god's life god did not create you to work 24 7 he created you to deeply rest one day out of the week Does that mean that we don't rest or worship on the other six days of the week? No, of course not. We shouldn't be Sunday Christians only. We should uh, sleep every day. Uh, We should worship God every day. However, rest and worship are not the dominant activities of the other days. We do rest and worship on those days, but we would obviously say that the other six days are dominated by work and labor, right? Monday through Saturday. These are our work days. And that's okay. That's actually normal. It's actually good. We need to realize that work in and of itself, it was ordained and commanded by God even before sin, even before the fall. He tells us to work and labor for six of the days. So uh, 
working hard on non-Sabbath days, that's actually a good thing. Being studious, being industrious, being productive during the other days of the week, it is a very good thing. But on the Sabbath, he tells us to rest. Sabbath uh, is where we get the word sabbatical, uh, which means extended period of leave or rest. And you know, sometimes pastors have a sabbatical uh, after seven years of uh, labor in ministry. Your Sabbath is most likely Sunday. Uh, maybe it might be Saturday. Maybe it be, might be Monday. But your Sabbath most likely is Sunday. And so your Sunday, your Sabbath, it should feel different. It should look different. It should be different, again, from other days of the week in that it should be dominated by deeper rest and deeper worship. Make your day different by getting more rest and participating in more worship. If you happen to work on Sundays out of necessity and mercy, let's say you're a doctor on call or you're a nurse or you're a policeman or you're a fireman, then we should pick another day out of the week to have Sabbath rest. I don't believe the Sabbath has to be on Sunday, although it is uh, ideal for us in the New Testament era to uh, have the Sabbath on Sunday. I don't believe your Sabbath has to be on Sunday. The point of the Sabbath is not which day of the week to rest, but that you take a day of the week to rest. The point is don't work seven days a week. Don't email 24-7 Don't be on call every single day. Guard one day out of the week for rest and refreshment. So for pastors, Sunday is not our rest day. Uh, It's our work day. It's probably our longest work day. So pastors generally observe their Sabbath on Monday. So tomorrow would be my Sabbath. So Monday would be a day of No preaching, no intense studying, no meetings, no work, but more relaxing, more family time, more eating out. But again, the Sabbath is also not just a day of more physical rest. It is a day of more spiritual rest. If you set apart the Sabbath only by lounging and sleeping and vegetating without worshiping, You're not fully keeping the Sabbath. That's only half of it. The Sabbath commands us to rest from work so that we could rest and worship. And I'll say this. Rest without worship is a fruitless Sabbath, but rest and worship is faithful Sabbath. I'll say that again. Rest without worship is a fruitless Sabbath, but rest and worship is a faithful Sabbath. So yes, our bodies do need rest, but more importantly, our souls also need rest. So so often we try to just rest our bodies, but we don't really replenish our souls. That's why we could take a break from things uh, when we're spiritually burnt out, and after the break, we're spiritually just the same. Uh, you need to actually worship your way out of spiritual burnout. Also, when God tells us um, to remember the Sabbath, realize that he says, remember the Sabbath day. He doesn't say, remember the Sabbath hour. Because a lot of us, we assume that just because we came to church for an hour, that we have remembered and observed the Sabbath. But he says, Not to remember the Sabbath hour. He says, remember the Sabbath day. Now, I'm not going to make the case that the Sabbath day means literal 24 hours. But I will make the case that it means more than just one hour. The Sabbath is meant to be an extended, unhurried date with God. Can you imagine going on a date with, let's say, your fiancé or your a uh, newlywed spouse, and thinking to yourself, uh, let me get this hour over with so that uh, I can go and uh, spend the rest of my day for things that I really want to do. Like your fiancé or your, uh, yeah, your fiancé probably won't end up marrying you and your uh, newlywed spouse would probably be extremely upset with you. 
it's unfathomable thinking that we would just get our one hour date over with so that we could uh, spend the rest of our day to ourselves. Yet on the Sabbath date with God, sometimes we are like this sad married couple. Maybe the honeymoon phase is over and our minds and hearts are in a hurry uh, to do the things that we really want to do. You know, we could be in the presence of God physically, but maybe mentally and emotionally, uh, we could be somewhere else. We could easily treat the Sabbath as just an hour that we get over with so that we could have the rest of our day to ourselves. But God scheduled the Sabbath to have a weekly anniversary with you. For some of you, maybe your time is your biggest idol. Your schedule, your calendar is of utmost importance to you. And everything needs to be always planned and prepared ahead of time. And knowing that, God actually schedules himself into your life. See, God is a very practical God. He knows that you're busy. He knows that your schedules pile up quickly. And so he's saying, schedule your week around me, not me around your schedule. And he's scheduling himself in to your life because he loves you. The Sabbath is meant to be a day where we glorify God by enjoying him. It's not supposed to be a duty. It's meant to be a delight. It's not meant to be legalistic. It's meant to be liberating and freeing. So take this day to delight in him by stimulating your senses to savor and to be satisfied in God. Don't just hear the word, but meditate on the word and let it marinate in your minds. Don't just listen to the worship team sing songs, but join in with them in the singing of these songs because singing itself, it also stirs your soul. Don't leave right after the benediction, but engage in fellowship and community as a member of the body and even participate in uh, fellowship and small group. Once again, I'm not going to say exactly how many hours of the day fulfills uh, the Sabbath requirement. That's not the ultimate point. It's not a checklist of fulfillment of hours, but it's meant to be a fuller and deeper experience with God and with God's people. Now moving on to our second question, why should we Sabbath? Why should we Sabbath? First, the main reason why we should Sabbath is because we are no longer slaves, but we are now sons and daughters. We are no longer slaves, but we are now sons and daughters. What is the context of the Ten Commandments? The context of the giving of the Ten Commandments is that the Israelites spent 400 years in slavery. 400 years of slavery. Imagine that. Imagine your family having gone through 400 years of slavery. God's people, the people of Israel, were slaves in Egypt. That's all they knew. They were slaves, their parents were slaves, their grandparents were slaves, their children were slaves. All they knew was slave work. Endless work was not only their activity, but it was also their identity. You had to work seven days a week, 365 days a year. And a Sabbath would have been their dream. It would have been their dream. So what did God do? God made their dreams come true, and God actually gave them rest. God brought them out of slavery and brought them into Sabbath rest. God worked for them so that they would be able to rest in him. So now their identity is no longer slave, but is now son or daughter. And with this change in their identity resulted a change in their activity, now, for the first time in 400 years, the Israelites could now rest from working. See, slaves were not allowed to rest, but sons are able to rest. And God says, rest, because you are now my sons and daughters. So when we don't keep the Sabbath, when we don't rest, we're actually going backwards. We're going back to slavery 
back to bondage, back to what God freed us from, back to when we, um, but when we intentionally observe the Sabbath, we are remembering both who we were and who we also are now. We were once slaves to sin. We were once slaves to work. We were once slaves to Satan. But now we are sons and daughters of God. And so when we Sabbath, we are declaring that we are ex-slaves as we experience uh, the rest that he has given to us. Even before God lists the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, uh, in verse 2, he actually reminds his people with this preface. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. We cannot forget this fact. God gave you your house. God gave you your health. God gave you your food. God gave you your family. God gave you your job. God gave you everything you have. We must remember that. Without this preface, these commandments, they would just be burdens. But with this preface, these commandments are blessings from God. And in particular, the Sabbath commandment, it helps us by humbling us and allowing us to practically pause before God to count our blessings again and to give thanks to God because we forget him and we take things for granted. And he wants you to do that on a weekly basis. We as human beings are very forgetful people, especially the more rich we become, the more uh, full we become, the more successful we become. We forget about where we came from. Uh, We forget what it was like studying for that major exam, begging God to help us to pass and not to fail. We forget what it was like to have God graciously and providentially allow every step of our lives to align up, to position us to the places that we are today. We must not forget this. We need to remember. And the Sabbath helps us to do just that. It helps us to remember who we were, who we are, who God is, and what he has done for us. So we need to realize that you don't have to keep the Sabbath. You get to keep the Sabbath. It is your privilege. It is your gift. You are a child of God who gets to rest in your Father's perfect work for you. Think about this. Is there any other God that cares if you get enough rest? There's no other God that cares whether you rest or not. If you think about it, every other God, every other religion actually says work harder. But only our God, only the God of the Bible says rest harder. Every other God turns you into a slave. Only our God turns you into a son or daughter. What a great God and Father that we have that he actually commands us and calls us to rest. Secondly, uh, another reason why we should um, Sabbath is because observing the Sabbath strengthens your faith. Observing the Sabbath strengthens your faith. It may sound ironic, but it actually takes faith to rest. It takes faith to rest because resting is essentially letting go of your control. Resting may mean that someone is out there grinding overtime, making huge gains and profits while you are not taking advantage of these extra hours. So resting, it takes faith. And God wants you to continually put your faith in him. Resting requires that you trust in God's work more than your own work. So God actually introduced and implemented this Sabbath trust actually even before the official commandment in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Actually, if you go back a couple chapters in Exodus chapter 16, after God parted the Red Sea, after he saved the Israelites from the Egyptians, we see that the Israelites 
although they are now free, they start to complain. Why do they complain? It's because there is a desert that they have to go through before they get to the promised land. And so in uh, verse 2 of chapter 16, it says this. It says, The whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And then verse 3, it basically says that God should have, uh, God should have killed us in Egypt. Uh, there we sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve us all to death. Like, isn't it kind of ridiculous how quickly uh, people change, how quickly perspectives change? But we see that with the Israelites. They were just saved from slavery, and now they're complaining. They're basically saying, we had this all-you-can-eat buffet in Egypt, and now we're in this desert here having nothing to eat. And you would think that God would say, forget you all. You would think that he would say, I'm done with you. Just die here in the desert but amazingly in verse 4 his response to the complaints is this he says i will rain down bread from heaven for you i will rain down manna for you so god graciously provides this bread buffet from heaven and not only that he even provides meat he provides quail meat and he gave that to them in daily portions. And so what God systematically did was that for five days a week, Sunday through Thursday, uh, the Israelites were commanded to gather as much manna and quail uh, as they wanted to just for that day. So on Sunday, you collect just what you can eat for Sunday. Monday, you collect just what you eat for Monday. Tuesday, you just collect what you eat for that day. Every morning they had to go out and gather their meals. But if they gathered more than a day's worth and tried to save some for the next day, God caused that bread to rot and stink. So every day they had to trust that God would provide them daily bread. But on the sixth day, on Friday, they were commanded to gather not one day's worth of food, they were commanded to gather two days' worth of food. Why? It was because of the Sabbath, so that they could take a break on Saturday and to rest on the Sabbath, to eat whatever they had gathered on Friday, two days' worth of food. And that bread did not rot or stink. That meat did not rot or stink. Again, this required faith for them to rest because every day... Uh, Sunday through Thursday, they had to collect food every single day. So they would think, I have to collect it on Saturday as well. But he's saying, put your faith in me. Trust in me. Trust that I'm going to provide for you. I'm telling you on Friday to gather two days worth of food. Trust in me. Trust that this food is not going to rot or stink. And so every single day, um, they had to personally collect and work for their food. But on the seventh day, God told them not to go out. God told them to trust in him. Trust that you have enough bread uh, by what I have already provided for you on the sixth day. So they began to practically see for 40 years that God would provide for them so that they could rest in him. And the question for you and me is that, will the same God who provided for the Israelites, will he provide this way for you and me. The God who provided extra manna for his people on Friday, will this God continue to provide for you and me? Even though you take one day out of the week to rest and to not work like the rest of the world, will he provide for you and me? That is the question for us. So we see that the Sabbath, it strengthens our faith and our trust in God. You may be tempted to work every day. You may be tempted to study every day. You may be tempted to grind overtime. You may be tempted to trust in your work ethic just to get ahead. But that work ethic is biblically unethical. While you may experience short-term gains, you will experience long-term loss. 
you may gain a few more dollars, but you will lose your health, you'll lose your mind, you'll lose your fellowship with the body of Christ, and ultimately, you'll lose your intimacy with Jesus. That's most important of all. Many of you know the fast food restaurant Chick-fil-A, and um, I believe that is the best uh, fast food restaurant in the world. I believe that if Jesus were alive today, he would eat at Chick-fil-A. Um, but many of you know that Chick-fil-A was founded by Christians, and they follow uh, Christian principles. And one of those principles that they follow is that they observe and keep the Sabbath by resting and having all their employees rest every Sunday. Now, as a business, as a business model, this would be considered very dumb and very detrimental to your profits. Sunday is when you, you probably get the most customers out of any other day of the week. But by being obedient to God's word, even though there's a risk of uh, losing Sunday customers, they close and they rest on Sundays. And despite closing on this maybe most profitable day, by living by faith, they're actually experiencing more gains, more profits, more employee satisfaction, more customer satisfaction than any other fast food restaurant. Now, I'm sure they work very hard from Monday through Saturday, but on Sundays, they rest to observe the Sabbath. And sometimes it is sad because sometimes I crave Chick-fil-A on Sundays, uh, but that is what they have been convicted to do. They stick to their biblical convictions, and God has honored and blessed their business 30, 60, 100-fold. Now, you may not be a business owner, but even as a student, as a worker, it is tempting not to rest. It is tempting not to come to church in order to do what you have to do. It is tempting to just bulldoze your way you know, up the corporate ladder. But in the end, you will lose. In the end, you will lose. Be reminded of the parable of the sower, where the seeds uh, that were sown in one of the grounds, it grew, but then what happened? It was ultimately choked by the thorns, and it was ultimately choked down, and it ultimately yielded no grain. By not resting, you can experience short-term gains, but you'll experience long-term loss. You cannot win in the end without rest and worship. So put your faith in God by observing the Sabbath and observing what it does for you. Now moving on to our last question uh, to get very practical. How can we better observe the Sabbath? How can we better observe the Sabbath? First, you can better observe the Sabbath by preparing for the Sabbath the night before. Prepare for the Sabbath the night before. If your Sabbath is Sunday today, like for most of you, practically speaking, prepare for the Sabbath on Saturday night. Prepare for the Sabbath on Saturday night. In other words, prepare yourself to be ready for rest and worship. Come to experience the deepest, sweetest rest and worship on Sunday. Once again, Sunday, the Sabbath, is supposed to be our date with God. Let me ask you a question. Are you ever late for an important date? No, probably not. The more important the date is, the more prepared you will be not to be late. The last thing that I want to do is to, you know, guilt trip you or embarrass you, but really out of love, out of care, out of concern, I want to ask you, how do you view Sunday worship? See, if you miss out on a bulk of worship, it communicates to yourself, to others, and to God that worship is not that important to you. Missing out on the call to worship, on corporate singing, on the confession of faith, on the confession of your sin, the assurance of forgiveness, on prayer, that's missing quality time with God and God's people. Are you 
late to work? Are you late to an interview? Are you late to your favorite musical? We are never late for the things that are most important for us. And so if we have a hard time waking up for the Sabbath, then a practical thing that we ought to do is rest well the night before. And so I want to exhort you, don't stay up 1, 2, 3 a.m. the night before the Sabbath. To get very practical, maybe if you have a hard time getting ready, just pick out your clothes Saturday night so that you already know uh, your wardrobe the night before. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we need to prepare our minds and our hearts the night even before worship. One of my first sermons, you know, when I came to Emmanuel Church was entitled Pray for Your Pastors. And I want to ask you, do you pray for us pastors? Uh, do you pray for the preaching of God's word? Do you pray for receptivity to his word? Uh, please take even Saturday night to prepare through prayer. Pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Pray for our worship team uh, who leads us uh, into worship. Pray for a desire for even yourself, not only just to receive, but also to serve. Pray for our fellow brothers and sisters uh, here in church. How often do you pray for one another? Maybe on Saturday night uh, before Sabbath worship, you could pray for one another. Maybe if someone hasn't been coming out for a while, you could uh, even consider um, calling up someone and encouraging them uh, to come out. Pray for a desire for fellowship. Pray for protection from distraction. So we can better observe the Sabbath by preparing the night before. When we don't prepare for the Sabbath, we may not benefit from the Sabbath because we're not ultimately ready for the Sabbath. So prepare yourself by preparing maybe even the night before. Secondly, uh, I think another way that we can better observe the Sabbath is by incorporating resting time uh, from screen time. Incorporate resting from screen time. Living in 2019, there's probably no harder time in history uh, to keep the Sabbath. We live, as we all know, in a very distracted digital age. You know, some of you who are younger, you probably cannot even remember a time without the internet and smartphones. Uh, there is constant audio and visual stimulus at the tips of our fingers, at the flick of our wrist. We always receive instant notifications, instant gratifications. We receive dopamine overload, stimulating our brains with likes and emojis, especially if you're, if you're using your phone right before you sleep. And so even when we sleep, we probably don't get deep rest. We probably don't experience that REM rest, that rapid eye movement sleep. And so we wake up very groggy. And we just try to cover it up by drinking coffee or energy drinks. But that's like putting a band-aid on our lack of rest. And we, we see that this is not just a teenager problem. It's not a teenage problem. This is a college age problem. This is a young adult problem. This is a y adult problem. This is a grandparent problem. This is a universal problem. It's not just a first world problem. It's even a third world problem. Like I, I went to Cambodia uh, for two years for missions. And even in Cambodia, even in third world, they're like so distracted on uh, media. And a question I want to ask you um, is, are you the master of your phone or is your phone the master of you? I think so often you're not in control of your phone. So often your phone is in control of you. And so in that sense, we are functional slaves to our phones. We're unable to rest from our phones. We don't know what to do with ourselves without our phones. Like imagine leaving your house or your apartment without your phone for a day. Like would you be able to do that? I think some of us can't fathom that. We might get jittery like an addict who is trying to stop smoking. So we need to learn to 
take control and have self-control from our devices. If shutting down your devices for a day is impossible, maybe start implementing a lesser uh, discipline. Maybe you could implement uh, a rule, no electronic devices when I'm with people. At the very least, when I'm with people, no pulling out of electronic devices. Or maybe you can uh, have some kind of rule like, I'm only going to check social media twice a day for five minutes. Uh, whatever your conviction is, or whatever uh, discipline you want to implement for yourself, uh, consider not only resting your bodies, but consider also resting your eyes, resting your minds. Protect your eyes from eye fatigue and also protect your hearts from unnecessary anxiety. Moving on to our third uh, thing that we could do, uh, incorporate worship outside of church. Incorporate worship outside of church. Imagine every time you charged your phone, that you only charge it to 50%. Let's say you never charge your phone to 100%. You only charge it to uh, 50%. What would happen? Uh, what would happen is it would drain more quickly than it ought to. Um, it would not last as long as it was intended to. You would have to constantly put it on battery saving mode. Similarly, if we only worship God in church and never worship God outside of church, it's like we're charging ourselves to 50%. It's like uh, we're not charging ourselves to the full capacity that God has created us to experience on the Sabbath. So a lot of us, again, we come to church, we worship, but then we don't worship at all after church. It's like we're getting charged 50%. God intended us to recharge all day on the Sabbath day, not only during church, but even after church. There's no quick charge option. There's no, I'm just charged for an hour and then I'm charged for the whole day. God calls us to stay plugged into him fully, deeply. And again, I don't know if the Sabbath is meant to literally be 24 hours. I don't want to get into uh, some legalistic numbers like that but hopefully you are convinced that the sabbath is more than just one hour so during the other hours of your sabbath try incorporating a little more personal worship even after church again a great way to do that is to attend small group but if you're unable to do that at the very least like reread the sunday sermon passage uh, meditate on it, uh, pray the passage into your life, you know, listen to some more praise songs. Again, we're talking about how you know, we are living in a digital age. You know, that can be a, a distraction, but it could also be a blessing. Like, let's redeem our electronic devices. And on your electronic devices, you have uh, the music bank, free praise worship, uh, music that you could listen to for free. Like, I mean, what a time that we live in. You have Bible apps. You have biblical resources. You have everything at, you know, your fingertips. Let's redeem even uh, the technology uh, that is given to us. There are varieties of ways that we could uh, continue to enjoy the Sabbath. Maybe even just taking a nap. Uh, we might think, like, is that worshipful? I, it can be worshipful if you're uh, really doing that to recharge uh, your body uh, for the glory of God. You know, maybe just enjoy nature, enjoy creation, eat good food. Again, take some time to pray for the members of our church. There are so many things that you could do on the Sabbath to incorporate a little bit more personal worship. Uh, and to set apart this day as holy to the Lord. Make the Sabbath your one-day retreat with God. Tomorrow, uh, Pastor Sam, Pastor Nick, and I, we're actually going on uh, two retreats, um, two pastor's retreats. Uh, one is a EM pastor's retreat, uh, which is starts from Monday morning to Monday afternoon, and then starting from Monday night, 
uh, to Wednesday morning, we're going to a youth pastor's retreat. And the best thing about these retreats is that they're free. <laughs> uh, Koreans love free, right? Uh, so uh, we're going to these uh, retreats, and um, I'm very much looking forward to these retreats because uh, sometimes as pastors, you know, we prepare for retreats, we, we serve at retreats, but sometimes we don't have our own retreats. And uh, it just so happened that these two retreats lined up perfectly that we could also uh, receive uh, and also experience rest and I'm grateful that my wife is allowing me to uh, experience this rest because that means that she has to work overtime watching our kids uh, but again we're resting uh, not only to retreat away from the world but we are resting so that we could be replenished so that we could be rejuvenated so that we could be recharged for the work of the ministry and that's what God wants us all to experience he wants us to rest and retreat so that we could be replenished and rejuvenated and recharged for our work as well. As pastors, it's, it's hard to rest as well. You know, we're always thinking, we're always working, we're always preparing. And so, uh, again, I look forward to be receiving so that we could better give of ourselves for you. And lastly, uh, another way that uh, we could better observe the Sabbath is to think about the eternal Sabbath. Think about the eternal Sabbath. Every Sunday, every Sabbath day should be for us a little foretaste of the eternal rest that we will experience forever and ever. There will come a day where, I don't know if you can believe it, but we will never tire, we will never toil, we will never strive. We will never be busy. There will come a day when we will no longer be tempted by sin, never give in to sin, or ever fight with sin. There will come a day when we will experience perfect peace, peace of mind, peace of heart, peace of soul. There will come a day when we will have no fears, no worries, no anxieties, no tears, no pain. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, it says, There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So every Sunday, hopefully, we allow ourselves to experience a little glimpse of the eternal Sabbath. Verse 11 of Hebrews 4, it also says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Let us strive to enter that eternal rest by striving also into earthly rest. You know, if you think about the way we observe the Sabbath in the New Testament, we know that it has shifted from Saturday to Sunday. And there are two main reasons why it has shifted from Saturday to Sunday. Uh, one main reason is because Jesus rose again from the dead on Sunday, and so we essentially celebrate uh, the resurrection every Sunday. So every Sunday is almost like a celebration of Easter. But secondly, think about the calendar. Starting the week with rest rather than ending the week with rest. Starting the week with rest, Christians are theologically making a statement that we don't work in order to rest, but we actually rest in order to work. That's the theological statement that we're making, that Christians don't um, work in order to rest, they rest in order to work because Christ has worked for us we can now rest in his work and then rest, work from his rest. And so from that restful experience, as we are rejuvenated and recharged, we can respond by working hard for his kingdom and not our own. We need to realize, brothers and sisters, that God loves us enough to command us to rest. He cares for our health. He cares for our holiness. He cares for our humility. So remember who God is and what he has done for you. Remember and keep remembering because, again, we keep forgetting just like the Israelites. Remember that this world is not your home. This world cannot give you true rest and security. Our God can give us rest and security. Are you worried? Are you anxious? Are you stressed? Are you struggling? Give those things to God. Give your worries to God. Give your struggles to God. He, know, he knows you. 
and he cares for you. Let's remember the words of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 11 where he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will experience rest for your souls. Let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. And before I close us in prayer, I just want to give you a minute um, to reflect and to respond to this loving, caring, gracious commandment. This is not a command to be neglected. This is not a command to be ignored. But this is a command uh, that must be heeded for your help. We are not created um, to work constantly, perpetually, but we are created um, to rest in God and to also worship God. When we neglect that, um, we will lose in the end. Again, you may experience short-term gains, but you will experience long-term loss, namely losing uh, intimacy uh, with Jesus himself. Consider your relationship with God. Uh, is it marked by distance? Is it marked by fear? Is it marked by um, just apathy? Could it be that we have not been faithfully observing the Sabbath? Um, let's ask that God would allow us uh, to remember the Sabbath and observe the Sabbath so that we could regain uh, intimacy, uh, reliance, and dependence upon uh, our God. Let's go to God in prayer at this time.